Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 19 of Nostalgia Talk. Oh my god, 19 episodes. We're one show away from the big 2-0, which is coming next week, but I'm not going to say much about that yet. Before I start, I just have a little shout-out I'd like to give, not to a past guest on Nostalgia Talk, but for some of you nostalgia lovers out there, you'll probably be familiar with this guy. I'd like to wish a happy birthday to voice actor Rob Paulson. Uh, some of you would know Rob best as Yakko from Animaniacs. PJ from Goof Troop, Mark Chang from The Fairly Odd Parents, Pinky from Pinky and the Brain, Carl and Jimmy Neutron. Uh, he was on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, my family met Rob in LA uh, a couple of years ago, and he treated my family very kindly. He was, he, he was like, oh, I love Canada. I love the Maritimes. You know, he's a big hockey fan. Uh, and also a very good friend of past guests, Bob Bergen and Pat Fraley. So, Rob, I really would like to have you on the show sometime if you're interested. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Rob. <laughs> and that right there is my guest, Tom Spawn. Welcome, Tom. How are you? Oh, Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you here. Now, Tom is a he's got a, quite a he's got quite an interesting career. He's a sound designer, sound mixer, mix editor. He's done so much for film, TV, uh albums uh oh god the list goes on and on tom would you uh, would you mind explaining a little bit about what it is that you do well, what i've done for sesame street for since 1980 is well i my first job with sesame was producing uh big bird gets ready for school uh it was a record back in the 80s they did records and sent them out you know that was my first job. I produced that. And then uh, then I ended up working up at NOLA Recording, which is where that record was produced. I ended up working up there full time. And I worked there from 1980 till about 2000, 20 years. Wow. Yeah. And uh, before I, again, another little shout out, before I uh, start out uh, the interview, I would like to pass along a little shout out to another past guest who got me in touch with Tom, Sesame Street vocalist Ivy Austin, one of the loveliest people, one of the kindest and sweetest people I've ever met, way nicer than me. I'm just going to say that right now, way nicer than me. She got me in touch with Tom. And so Ivy, if you're listening to this, I know I've said it already, but thank you very much for getting us in touch. Uh, I have a feeling that this is going to be a very interesting show. Oh, good. I, I hope I live up to that, Ivy. <laughs> so what did you aspire to want to become? The Beatles. <laughs> really? The Beatles? Sure, yeah. The Beatles were the, were the wake-up call for everyone my age. Oh, so you wanted to be one of the Beatles. Yeah, or just just to be creative like them, you know. And I think that's one reason why I've been with Sesame so long is that I enjoy coming in and recording. And it's always a different topic. I mean, we're working on something different all the time. It's not the same thing over and over, you know. And so, um, you know, I mean, my you and I were talking a little bit as we were getting started that uh, I did a. Uh, the animal orchestra for Sesame in, I guess, around 1985-ish. 87, I think, is actually 87, when that was. there you go. Okay. And, uh, and it was Chris Surf, who you've had on your show, who came in one day and said, could you get a pig to sing in tune? <laughs> and I said, I actually could. And so um, they gave me a, there was a sound effect guy who came in who had, who I was impressed because he did the Whirlpool commercial where the world, where the, where the uh, washer machine was falling apart. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he had done that. And I was impressed about that, but then he came in and gave me chicken sounds and geese sounds and frogs and pigs. And, and we did all these sounds and then I put them on the keyboard and made it, um, you know, so that, you could play a scale with a frog or a pig. Oh, and that's wow. what the animal orchestra is. And then Dave Connor, who was Ivy Austin's father's working partner, he was the vocal coach. He came in and, uh, and played out those parts and made, made that, um, you know, musically what he wanted it to be. 
and he would say, oh, do you have a chicken? Oh, do you have a duck? Oh, do you have a this? And, and then we would play it in and we made the piece come together. And then Richard um, Hunt um, came in and sang his vocal. And then the next thing I did is I saw it, you know, with Sergio Zawa, you know, conducting all the animal puppets. <laughs> I remember that skit from when I was a kid. I had it on a, a DVD, and uh, I, I, Placido Flamingo was before my time. Richard Hunt passed away before I was born, but I really loved his characters. Not all, not many of them were around when I was a kid, but I remember the All Animal Orchestra. That's a really cool story. Mm-hmm. And then, and then we did a follow-up with Wynton Marsalis. Oh wow! There's, a, there's another one somewhere with Winton. I don't. I've, I really haven't seen that one on YouTube as much, but I know that there's another one out there. Did you see the latest uh, jazz show that uh, Winton Marsalis did with the Muppets a couple of I, months ago? I didn't see it. I I heard the I heard the you know the different uh, characters that do it talking about it and how wonderful they thought it was. But I haven't seen it. What what was it on? Was it on? Where was it? broadcast well when it when, when it when it happened in 2019 it was uh it was live streamed on jazz.org and in october it was aired on pbs uh it might uh, be might be on youtube somewhere might Somebody be on youtube now it. yeah uh or maybe some of the muppet people that were on it have posted it to uh posted clips of it to instagram or facebook or twitter perhaps uh-huh mm. it was really cool yes i i wasn't involved with that directly but i was doing some projects where we crisscrossed and they they talked about it how wonderful it was oh wow so what was your first job in your career that you have like my first job was not, uh, not just sesame street but in the whole recording industry well i i was gonna go to college my parents ran a music conservatory my whole life so i grew up around musicians and creative people and then uh, when I got up to high school and was going to college, I was going to go to Southern Illinois University. But when I went down to audition for them, the teachers there were really not as well trained as the people that I grew up with. So I kind of like fell out of, you know, I just didn't understand why I would want to go four years somewhere where I didn't, you know, I didn't think I was getting the best education, the best people. So I decided I wasn't going to go. And my father very wonderfully said to me, um, you know, I said, I don't want to go to school. And he goes, oh, I'm sure you've got some great reasons why you're not going to school. But what I need to know is what are you going to do? Oh, wow. Which I, as an 18-year-old, 17, 18-year-old young man, I had not, I knew all the reasons why I didn't want to do something but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And my mother, thank goodness for her, reached out to some friends of hers and got me working with a band called the Wright Brothers, where my first job was working with them at the Playboy Club in Chicago, which at that, in the 70s, 73, I guess that was, um, that was the headquarters for the Playboy Club. That was before Hugh Hefner had moved out to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, that was my first job. It was it was a neat old job. I didn't really know what to do. I, I did. I just was dropped into that environment. You know, I was I was a spring chicken here, especially working with Playboy. <laughs> yeah. So that was quite that was my first job. And then I toured about two years with that band Wright Brothers and we went all over the country and uh, up in Canada, Vancouver. I love Vancouver. Mm. Um, and then, uh, then in 1975, I decided that I was, you know, uh, you know, you could either go to the West Coast, and in that era, it was like the Carpenters and 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 that West Coast sound. And then there was Hall and Oates, which was really yes. Philadelphia, but they were. They had done their record, uh, She's Gone, in New York. Ooh. And so I said, I think I want to go to New York because that's more soulful and, and, and exciting music there. 
And that's what brought me, the song She's Gone is what brought me to New York in 1975. And then I met Bonnie Sanders, who was the wife of Arthur Shimkin, who ran Sesame Street Records. And in 1979 or 80, around there, they asked me to produce a Big Bird Getting Ready for School. Nice. I, speaking of the uh, Getting Ready to, for School record, uh, they did a home video release called uh, Getting Ready for School. Are you familiar with that one? Uh, not directly. When did they do that? I mean, that came out in 1987. Yeah, well, that was, they probably, I don't know what the songs are on there, but they would like maybe redo, you know, reuse the songs that we recorded, maybe. I don't know. I don't think they did. Uh, I do remember uh, Chris Surf, uh, his little Chrissy character singing uh, Raise Your Hand uh, in the Classroom. I think that was a Jeff Moss song. Um, uh, I remember. Well, I, I could have worked on it and I don't even remember it because, so, see, so for so many years, you mentioned uh, earlier, did uh, Ivy work with uh, Jim Henson? Mm -hmm. and and that was my, one of the questions I asked her. My Jim Henson story would be that. You know, I started working up at NOLA because I had produced that record. And um, and uh, so Jim Henson comes in and records some song. I don't remember what it was. But back then, we were recording on a 24-track. Okay. Two-inch multi-track. And the band would have recorded, and we would have had like three, maybe four tracks open to record Jim. Um, but then it would get to a point where they had a performance they liked and we're working on another track. And, you know, when you pushed record, it's not like pushing record on Pro Tools now where we keep everything. And if you make a mistake, you can edit it and bring it back. When you pushed record, you were erasing something. Oh, for him to perform a one hopefully better. So he was, he was working with Dave Connor, who I mentioned earlier, the vocal mm -hmm. coach back then, who had Paul, Paul Rudolph's job up until Paul showed up. Um, and Dave was uh, in the booth with Jim Henson. And, you know, they would say, We're, we want to come in for this line and we want to save this line. So, you know, punching in and punching out. And I really didn't interact too much other than they tell me what, you know, what, they wanted to fix and I push record and get out and you'd, and you'd hope you didn't uh, erase something that they needed. That was my concern. But finally they got through this one line and they got Jim Henson to sing the melody that was on the lead sheet. And I said, there you got it. And wow. Jim Henson says, yes, I have it. Now I have to get Ernie to do it. Oh, wow. And it wasn't until Jim had said that to me, and I was probably 20, 25 at that point. Um, but it wasn't until he had said that, that I realized, oh, these, the, these characters have character. You know, that Ernie sounds like Ernie and Kermit sounds like Kermit. And, and even though it's the same guy and there may be similarities, they really knew the difference. And that was really a a learning uh, point for me because and, and the humility of, of Jim in the middle of all this of saying, yeah, I finally got it, but now I got to get Ernie to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of see where, where you're saying because, you know, on one hand, you have all the fact that these puppeteers pretty much are their characters, but it's different identities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Jim was very humble. I mean, Jim wasn't the greatest singer or musician you know he he relied a lot on on dave connor back in those days mm. you know to say you know they called dave connor's uh joking name was one more time dave because <laughs> you know they do it they go okay did we do it right you go well, let's do it one more time mm. dave connor and uh actually since you were talking about um ivy's dad danny epstein i will say that dave connor and danny epstein put together this uh i i think they put it together anyway but i had a copy of these vhs tapes called sesame street start to read and they put in some of the most beautiful compositions i have ever heard 
Yeah, that would that would probably be Dave, and and mo mostly Dave did the music. D Danny would would uh would contract it and oversee it, but uh, Dave Dave was uh down there in the in the pits working with me. Uh, when was that put together? Uh, the, the Star to Read videos. Mm -hmm. There were two that were released in '87, and there were two that were released in '91. Basically, what they were were stills of Sesame Street books, and Carol Spinney was narrating them as Big Bird, and he would he would even do the voices of the other characters. It was like it was like Big yeah, Bird. Yeah, see, those are the kind of yeah. things that I would work on as a recording engineer. I don't remember it for the project, but when you describe what what was going on those are the kind of things that i ended up doing in studio b at nola and i will also point out that the most of the books that they were uh, that were in those videos were illustrated by my good friend joe matthew another guest who was on this show oh do you know him no okay he's been an illustrator with them for years yeah mm. So one of your you know biggest things with sesame street and when when ivy uh Told me told me about you uh her exact words were that you put the tickle in tickle me elmo can you talk a little bit about that yeah you got to be careful how you say that now because in this in this politically correct world i could end up on charges all right well i'll i'll clarify so basically <laughs> he put the sound the laugh yes i didn't elmo actually laughing. tickle elmo um so um Yes, I had the good fortune. Again, Dave Connor came to me one day and said, well, I had done the animal orchestra, so they knew that I could do sampling, and and I was kind of like the techno part of Sesame Street in the mid-'80s to the, or, you know, I'd say mid-'90s. Um, and uh, Dave comes to me one day and goes, uh, I'm going to introduce you to a woman named Adrian Peters. Now, do you mm -hmm. know who that is? I don't. She is the woman who tickled Elmo. See, because at that point in, uh, in Elmo's development, some of the directors on the set were going to Kevin. I think you can, you can get this story off of uh, Kevin's, um, you know, Elmo and Me or whatever that movie was. Being Elmo. But being Elmo. That was a good but, documentary. Yeah, I think in there he says something about the, the original director of the show at the time who was directing whatever segment Elmo because Elmo you know was a throwaway from Richard Hunt right Richard Hunt goes I can't deal with this puppet and threw it and Kevin took it and made it the Elmo that we know and love now <clears throat> but the director kept on telling uh, Kevin you know don't laugh so much the laugh isn't working it's annoying and uh and Kevin's going, no, I think the laugh, I think the laugh's good. <laughs> so Kevin would keep doing it. Well, finally, Adrian Peters hears it and goes, we should make Tickle Me Elmo. And so they needed someone to be able to chop up all of the sounds because she had a wonderful way of, of making our sound sound better than everyone else. If there was a They'll, they'll sit there and say it's a 10 second chip or something. I think it was 12, 12 second chip, but that's an eight bit audio. Well, she didn't, we couldn't afford to go to 16 bit audio, which is basically where CDs are now. But she goes, I could go up to 12 bit audio and we would improve the sound, but we would lose our 12 seconds. Now we only have eight. Ooh. So we would chop up Elmo's laughter and she would say, how much do all of those segments add up to in time? And I would line them up and I'd say, oh, we have eight and a half seconds. She goes, got to get rid of a half a second. We have to go in there and she'd figure out how to chop up a half a second. And that way she could run it at a higher bit rate mm -hmm. and get a better sound for the Tickle Me Elmo toy. So we sounded better than all the other toys at, of the era because of her. But she, you know, she was the brains behind it and I, and I was the brawn. Is that she would, you know, say, well, we gotta get it down to eight seconds. And so we would figure out how we could reuse this part of this laugh and we would program it 
to go, ha, 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 <laughs> you know, and, and get it to sound like a performance of Kevin's, but not be a whole performance that ate up four seconds. Wow. So that was really something. Mm. And we did a lot of Tickle Me Elmo's. We did them in German and French, and they, Austrian. And they were, and they mean, were also versions, uh, like Tickle Me Elmo adaptations of other characters. Like there was Cookie Monster and Big Bird and Ernie, Zoe. Cookie Monster, I don't think we were ever really successful with a Tickle Me Cookie. Because, oh, it, it just couldn't, we couldn't get a good sound on that so they might have done other things hmm. but we did we did and and of course uh, ernie was difficult because he's just got the so that that's just wasn't... yeah he's just got the, a very simple laugh <laughs> yeah so uh but but we did we did do uh and then we did a big project with big bird trying to do some sampling but then elmo just went through the roof and uh and it, and next, and next thing you know, Black Friday of 1996 happens. What happened Black Friday of 1996? That was basically when Tickle Me Elmo went, w w just went through the roof, and everyone was was. Was that the day? Them. Was that the day? Yeah. That was when everyone was trying to get their hands on them. I actually read online that a storekeeper in Fredericton, New Brunswick, which is four hours away from where I am, was badly injured because everyone was pushing like crazy to get a Tickle Me Elmo doll for their kid. Yeah, no, there was a big, there was a big uh, Elmo mania. Mm -hmm. days. I was born when Elmo's World was brand new. Ah, mm. see, I did a lot of those sound effects, like the bubbles. Oh, cool! So at the beginning, we had to, we had to do, we had to lay that in a, at the beginning of every show, you know. And um, yeah, Elmo's World was. Now, my son's about your age, he's maybe a year older, but we would sit down and watch Elmo's World together. And my, my son would kind of go, oh, enough, you know. I mean, we would go to the Elmo, we would go to the Sesame Christmas party and his friends, he'd bring a friend and his friend would go, wow, this is cool. My, my son would go, yeah, my dad brings me here every year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but we we're watching Elmo's World and he was kind of like, oh, but what he liked was um, Teletubbies. Oh yeah, I remember the Teletubbies. And that was kind of running against it at that time. So anyway, we would end up, but one day he gets up in the morning and I was watching Elmo's World to just see how it was on the broadcast. And he came out. And so I turned the channel over to Teletubbies or SpongeBob is, I have a deep affection to SpongeBob. How could you not? Because SpongeBob's because hilarious. Because of my son. Um, but anyway, we, uh, I came out and I turned the channel and he goes, no, 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 go back. So we went back and I couldn't believe he's wanting to watch Elmo's World. He goes, wait, 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 wait. And then all of a sudden after Elmo's World came Slimy's World. Oh, wow. Slimy, with, the, Slimy the Worm? Yeah, with Oscar the Grouch. And, uh, and we watched that for a little bit. And of course, Grou uh, Oscar said, well, I hope you have a rotten day. At which time my son, who was like two or three at this point, I mean, he was just speaking, so maybe three or four, but he turns to me and goes, now that's funny. <laughs> I had Marty Robinson on here not too long ago. Oh, I... one of my favorite people. Oh, hi, Well, hi, Marty, if you're listening. Slimy is actually my very favorite character that, uh, that he does. Oh, does he? I didn't know he did Slimy. Well, he, he puppeteers Slimy. Dick Maitland does the voice. Oh, okay. Yes. I actually had uh, one of the Tickle Me, I don't know which one it was, probably Tickle Me Elmo. I remember having Tickle Me Ernie, uh, but I will say as a little kid, the movement of that thing and the vibration actually freaked me out. You know, well, I think that's something, my son was like that. We saved a lot of money because we would take him to a, we would go to a shopping center or something. There would be those things that you could put a quarter in and the kid could ride it. My son did not want it to move. He had no use for that at all. He was just happy sitting on it. Mm -hmm. And I used to turn to my wife and say, we are saving a fortune. <laughs> so he didn't, like the, he didn't like the thing moving around either. It was like, oh, no, 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 no. 
Well, of course, now I walk every day and I've got head, I've got headphones on. I'm listening to music, usually stuff like Backstreet Boys. And as you can see, I know that none of the listeners can actually see, but Tom, as you can see by my shirt, Britney, Britney. Spears. I love Yeah, Britney. free Britney. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, so whenever I'm on my, uh, my walks nowadays, you know, I'm not scared of the movement of vibration anymore because nowadays when I'm on my walks, I got something vibrating in my pocket, my phone. <laughs> exactly. I've got to ask you, uh, did you put the talk in any of the other Sesame Street talking dolls? Like I have a, I have a few with me right here. Uh, chances are if they were talking and they were a doll, I had something to do with them, okay. especially if it was in the Tickle Me Elmo years. Okay, uh, let me pull out Up one Up through, right I would here. say, 2000. Okay, uh, let me pull one out right here. Um, did you work on the Sing and Snore Ernie? Probably. I don't... This thing. Yeah. Mm. So I actually dug the... the... God, well, it, ne it never shuts up. I actually dug what this. What year did that come out? This was in 1997. I actually read in the yes. book Sesame Street Unpaved that in 1997, 1.2 million of these Sing and Snore Ernie dolls were sold. Yeah, I'm sure Adrian Peters had something to do with that. And so therefore I did. Yeah. Uh, well, basic, basically, uh, I had this thing as a kid, but in ever since like 1999, but in all the years that I had this thing, it never once sang or snored. And I, I didn't know it was supposed to until I had grown up a little bit and, and had read online that this thing actually talked. So to get ready for this, I thought to myself, oh man, I'd like to show it to, uh, to Tom. So I pulled out the voice <clears throat> box and it was... It was closed and I was like, oh, I need I need a screwdriver to open this thing. So lucky for me, I had a multi-tool that I needed for school. So and there was a screwdriver in that. And thank God the screwdriver fit in the, the screws that were on the voice box. So I unscrewed it and put in some batteries. And the second that I put the last what battery. What kind of batteries does it need? Like little triple uh, A's or double A. Double A. Well, you know, um, I'll tell you a story. Adrian Peters is probably a very unsung hero of this whole era of to talking toys that you talk about. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of work for Adrian. Um, and of course the chip people, there was one point where the chip people from Japan came over to the studio and they came out to the waiting room and I greeted them and they, you know, they did all this, this bowing and giving you the card and all this. And one of the, the guy who was all, whoever was in charge comes up to me and goes, so we're going to meet the, the lady who tickles Elmo? And I said, yes, you're going to meet her. And so we were working on something or she was in the studio and I went in and said, well, you know, they're out there. But see, the chip people wanted to come over and meet her and tell the tell her all the technology that they had in their chips because when these sell a million th those are a million chips that got sold oh wow for you know so they wanted to come over and meet the lady who tickles elmo <laughs> that's a very interesting way to word it <laughs> that's exactly how he worded it and we got it we got a, a kick out of that you know but she she was she was the brain behind all these toys. Mm, well, I think the gimmick for this thing, because the the second that I put in that final battery, it started talking and I had never heard it talk. And it said, I feel great. So basically the gimmick, I guess, and I'll do, I'll do what I call a nostalgia talk bonus video later where I showcase it. But basically if you squeeze his hand, uh, I, right. I, I don't know if it'll sound good on a, on a mic. So I, I won't try it. Go ahead, okay. try it. Can you hear that? So if you yeah. lay it, so see that it. sounds like Steve Steve Whitmire. It is, yeah. and we probably uh, I, I that was definitely done with Adrian if it was at that era. Mm. And there it's sing so that there's why it's called sing and snore. So it's singing, and now it's starting to yawn a little bit. So I guess basically the gimmick is that it taught the importance of sleep. Yeah, as you as you play it, I'm I'm sitting there going, I remember working on that with Steve. 
Wow. Yeah. Well, I have another toy that, and, and, and uh, then once Ernie, once you pick up Ernie, no matter how long he was sleeping, uh, he says, I feel great. And even if you pick him up, like just when I picked him up to show it to you, it's, uh, it, it said, I feel great. Honestly, I can see why whoever had it before me took out the batteries. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I also have another uh, one, I, one I think I mentioned to you that uh, has Steve's voice in it and one I showcased on a Nostalgia Talk bonus. The, okay. ma- the Magic Talking Kermit the Frog from 1999. Yeah, well, that would, that would be uh, Adrian Zara. Okay, wow. So Adrian was dying of, uh, of cancer at the end. Oh. She was an amazing person. She would call me when we – I think the first big job that Matt Vogel did was doing all of the extra lines – for uh, oh we had all the names we we went and did a million names and adrian called me one morning and said uh you know what we need to do i i'm gonna be late i've got to go in for chemo today Uh and so you know we we showed up at 10 in the morning i probably showed up at nine but at 10 the talent came in and we started recording the names and adrian shows up around one around lunchtime <clears throat> and you know most people when they do chemo and stuff you know they take a day or two off adrian goes i'll just be three hours late you know so oh. she would come in and she was just an amazing amazing person and if you get a chance you know when you if you interview matt i would love to matt if you're or, listening send me a message matt or or uh, or kevin clash certainly um and the but and and carol spinney um you know adrian was the one who oversaw all these toys that you're talking about in that era Mm. and uh and she was just such an inspiration um of how to live and how to die really i mean she really was an amazing person Mm. well she might have uh had something she probably definitely had something to do with this uh Oh, I'm Perfect. sure she did. Yeah. Do you mind if I show you what it does? No, please show me. So if you squeeze its stomach, but uh, it sings, uh, as I was saying to Ivy, it sings Caribbean amphibian, but you can also squeeze its left foot, which has Jim Henson's signature on it as well. This was after Jim uh, passed right. away, but they put it on. So basically, this is what it does. Hello, Kermit the Frog here. Everybody sing. I'm a Caribbean amphibian. And if you squeeze his mouth, like it hums. And this hand, uh, I think that's flies. And so if you press Kermit's stomach, oh, he <laughs> eats the flies. And yeah, Dude. this this was uh, because Kermit was you know just a puppet that Jim Henson brought to Sesame Street when he was hired. This was uh, especially made for Sesame Street's 30th anniversary. And when I showcased this in another video. I showcased a VHS tape I have called The Best of Kermit on Sesame Street. Yes. Well, you know, it's a it, it's a little known fact that that uh, and I'm I'm actually surprised that the current Sesame Street doesn't uh, exploit this more. Maybe maybe they'll hear this and check it out. But Kermit left Sesame Street with Jim Henson, but the press Kermit with the press in the hat, right? The, the, the news, news. Yeah, we take you now to Kermit the Frog. He's still Sesame Street. Oh, I never thought of it that way. I, but that well, does kind of go back to something they, that Lewis well, they and left, Mitchell they left Ses- They left him, that character of Kermit is still Sesame Street. Yeah, it's... and it always surprises me that they don't make more of that because he is such a yeah. Uh, that's such an iconic character of him being the newsman. It's funny. I was just talking to Lewis Henry Mitchell last month. And, oh yes, Lewis, and, and he Wonderful was talking. Talent. Oh, I, 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 I really enjoyed talking to him as well. And he was saying that he designed a DVD cover and he wanted to have Kermit. Uh, on the DVD cover as reporter Kermit. And that's what they ended up doing. They were able to do it. Yeah. 
Yeah, he he might be part of the reason why I know about that. Oh, it, that that Kermit, Kermit the newsman, is Sesame property. I never thought of it that way because they also had Kermit as a reporter on the Muppet Show. Uh, this is Kermit the Frog reporting from the planet Coosbane, but it was he wasn't wearing the same attire that he does on Sesame Street. I guess maybe they wanted to make it look a little different. They maybe needed to. Mm. I also have another little surprise here. You were talking about uh, the Animal Orchestra. I have a CD with me right here called Elmo's Low Down Ho Down, and your name is in the booklet. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. I'll open it up. Uh, How do you have – you have all of this stuff? Your I house am, must be just loaded with sesame memorabilia. Pretty much, yeah. For 22 years, I've been collecting these. Wow. <laughs> And your name is credited under special thanks. Okay, so I'm special thanks at that point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did actually have a Sesame Street PC game uh, for computers. Uh, it was called Music Maker, and I watched a little gameplay of it on YouTube just for, like, nostalgic memories. And you were credited as Mix Engineer. That, that, that game featured Elmo, Ernie, uh, Cookie Monster, and Grover, introducing the player to these little mini games where they could like oh make those cd rom games yeah. yes mm -hmm. now those were produced by miles ludwig oh yeah i, I miles, saw that name miles was, was miles was amazing riding that pony because you know the cd roms came out and went through the roof like elmo's world or mm -hmm. like elmo tickle me elmo did and then the next year just like plummeted i mean it was like up and then down and then then it became online games and those went up like crazy mm -hmm. but because it had gone down they had they had miles really lobotomize his whole department that knew how to make this stuff and now you can and, just get games on your phone <laughs> and then a year later when they wanted to make them more online for internet um Miles had to go back and try and hire back all these people he let go. It, it, it was a, it was a, it was a, a, if you get a chance, you might, you might chat with Miles. So do you have a favorite Muppet character? Well, I have a warm feeling for Elmo because I spent so much time with him. Mm -hmm. But I think the one that, um, the one that makes me laugh consistently, and I did probably the least volume of work with him, but every time he did it, it, it always killed me, was the Count with his uh, Stellone and Alone, you know, because I used to laugh with, uh, with um, oh, Nelson. Uh, Jerry Nelson. Nelson. Jerry Nelson. I used to laugh with Jerry because, well, Jerry – used to come and smoke like a chimney um yeah that's what i heard the other day from brian j jones but he was so funny and i would sit there and uh i would laugh because allowing he doesn't do the w the v but 12 he does perfectly <laughs> i go how come it's not 12 he goes eh, that doesn't sound funny he goes oh. Seven, alone sounds funny <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I think I, I think I get it. Let me see if I can uh, break it down. Uh, I've been learning how to do all these voices since I was a kid. The count was one of the first. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. See, five. Seven. He would do five good. Five. Mm. He would do a good V. I, I, five. I realize that. Six. I, I and then he goes, Stellon. I always noticed the seven as a kid. Seven, exactly. And I and I and so when you say, did I have a favorite character? The one that always made me laugh was when Jerry would count. Mm. And because I ended up doing a lot of these toys, and, and whatever, whatever. I mean, I can't tell you how many times he counted for us. Um, I'm sure he but, might. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I always got a kick out of his cell. But five is is. No V problem. Mm. <laughs> mm. Well, and then I also like Telly. Ah. Uh, I mm. always get a kick out of Marty having the nervous breakdown. 
Kelly over a triangle or over whatever, whatever he decided to freak out over. I was watching an episode today that featured uh, Telly. Uh, this was an, an episode that's older than me, but it was where Gina, the human character, was graduating, and there was a Muppet on the show at the time named Ruby. And uh, Ruby, uh, do you remember Ruby, an orange, yellowish female Muppet monster? Well, I think was was that done by um, who did that? Uh, Camille Benora. I hope I said that right. Okay. Yeah. But uh, Ruby was very close with Gina and um, Telly had said, well, what's Gina going to do after she graduates? And Ruby says, oh, maybe she'll go to college. Maybe she'll go to work or maybe she'll even go to the moon. And I have a feeling Ruby probably said that kind of facetiously. But Telly took it a little bit too seriously. (laughs) Because that's what you'd expect. Telly is very face value. Mm. Going back. Very very concerned about everybody. Very much. Going back to the topic of that game, uh, Music Maker, um, one of the mini games I really liked was, uh, it was called Studio 543. Like, and basically what that was, was Cookie Monster was a DJ, and he would play these um, these songs. They were on records, basically. And um, Elmo and Grover would dance to them. One of my very favorites was Cookie Monster's rendition of the song To Me Gustas, because it sounded a little bit like a mix of Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, and Eiffel 65. You know, very slow, but very upbeat. Yeah, and that was that was a CD-ROM game? Yep. Yeah. So that's all Miles' group. Um, just, they were so creative, and they would come in the studio, and we did so many of them that I'm not remembering them individually. I mean, they're just kind of next. And you started off by saying, what do I like about this? Is that it was always a different topic, you know, oh, we're working mm-hmm. on this, oh, we're doing this, oh, we're doing that. And it was always, you know, fun to, the change of topic. And mm-hmm. and to have the opportunity of working with Bill Moss or Joe Raposo, um, I did a lot of work with Joe. Oh, wow. Um, that would be something that you probably are interested in. Mm. Joe was always, always late. But every session that I ever had. And Joe also wrote that song I mentioned, To Me Gustas, with Jeff Moss. Ah. Well, see, he would, um, he wrote it with Jeff Moss? Yeah, they, they co-wrote it. That's unusual. It's one of you my don't own. find many songs with Jeff Moss and Joe Raposo. They actually co-wrote one of my very favorites, which was um, Jim Henson was doing his little Manamana guy. And uh, he would come in and he'd say a word like uh, the most famous. It would be like a fat. And then this Muppet would come in cat. And then another Muppet would come in sat. Another Muppet would come in hat. And then Jim's Manamana guy would come in and sing a fat cat sat on a hat. Saw a rat on the mat. It's one of my dad's favorites too. Ah, and that's a Joe Raposo, Jeff Moss song. Yeah. One of the best, one of the most classics. Cause they, um, they were very competitive. They were, it was like Princeton and Harvard going against each other. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. Well, because, you know, Joe writes, um, you know, I don't remember the exact order, but if you think about Rubber Ducky and things like that, when Rubber Ducky came up, that's a Joe Jeff Moss song. That's not mm-hmm. a Joe Raposo song, but it becomes a big hit. Mm. Well, then Joe goes, well, I got to get something better. So he would write, you know, sing, mm. you know, and, and they, they were always competing in the era that I was with them, which was basically 1980 till, till, till both of their deaths. But I guess Joe died in what, 92? 89. 89. Okay. And when did Jim Henson die? 92, 91? He passed away in 1990. 90 okay so they're only a year apart yeah so i worked with joe you know for those eight or nine years there from 80 till 89 interesting i actually made i was so i thought that the sound the the way that the that version of two me gustas on the music maker cd rom sounded so cool that i actually made a little video of it i can't post it on my youtube channel but i can send it to you if you'd like me to do that do please yeah 
Sure. And it's so funny that I compared it to Eiffel 65. Uh, for the, for the, if, if some of you guys don't know who Eiffel 65 is, they did that song, I'm Blue, and Tom just raised his hand. <laughs> they did that song from the 90s, I'm Blue, da ba dee da ba da da ba dee And it's funny that I compared that version of Tu Me Gustas to uh, Eiffel 65. Well, send me the link to both of them. But okay. see, that was, that was kind of what Sesame and what Joe was particularly good at. But so was Jeff Moss, and so was Chris Surf, for that matter. Mm. Um, you know, is that you know they would they would model the song off of something that was already popular, mm. and do something just like it but different. Yeah, especially Chris Surf because he did a lot of the parodies, like yeah. Born, to, Born to Add is one of my favorites. Yes. Mm. Yeah, Chris uh, did a lot of the parodies, but. Well, but the song that you were mentioning, which I'm not all that familiar with, but you'll you'll send it to me. Mm -hmm. see, because see, they would record the band in the front studio at Sesame at at Nola, mm -hmm. and then they would send a two inch back to me in Studio B, and Richard Hunt or you know Jim. H well, see Jim Henson. By the time I was really working up there a lot. Jim Henson and Frank Oz, they would just show up for like two or three weeks and do the whole season. Right. Because they were they had projects of their own at the time. Yes. Yeah, so they would come in and they would they would prep and they would know what they were gonna do for the whole year. And we would get all that work done and then we would record them getting them done. Mm. So it was just pre-recorded so that it would work around their schedules. Well, singing, singing is always pre-recorded as long as I've been with Sesame. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't imagine telling someone that they've got to sing the melody right, they've got to get the words right, they've got to get the pitch and everything right, and then tell them to get under the table and hold their arm up in the air. You know, it's like, no, no. They always pre-recorded singing mm. because they couldn't tune it afterwards if they sang it wrong or, you know, Nowadays, we can do amazing things of fixing things in the mix. But back then, they had to perform it. Mm. Yeah, there was, a, uh, there was actually a little mini game in that uh, CD-ROM. Uh, it was called Ernie's World. And again, this was at the popularity of Elmo's World. But, and I used to get them kind of mixed up. But basically, it would be all four characters that were in the game, Ernie, Cookie Monster, Elmo, and Grover. And... The monster Muppets would sing a uh, would, would sing this song, and Ernie would intentionally mess it up. Like for example, um, if it was Cookie Monster doing C's for Cookie, uh, then Ernie would have the player choose words where he would um, kind of put into the into the song. So it would be like a C is for cabbage. Oh, uh, that Ernie, what are you doing? C is for cabbage. Oh, sure, yeah, that good enough for me. C is for cookie cabbage, and so he would just interrupt him throughout the whole. Funny. Thing. So I have a feeling that that probably. I have a feeling that this was after Jim Henson passed away, but Frank Oz was still doing Cookie Monster and Grover, and Steve was doing Ernie. So it was like playful banter that, uh, and it's something that Paul Rudolph was telling me about comedic timing because that's something Jim Henson and Frank Oz were good at. Excellent. Yeah. Very and funny. and I, I do actually think that um, uh, using I, the song uh, I'm Blue by Eiffel 65 would have been interesting for that because, as I said, it was Elmo and Grover dancing while Cookie Monster was the DJ. You've got two blue Muppets in there that could be singing I'm Blue. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, it was it was it was brilliant what those. That whole team did for starters on the. On the on the um, show, you know. Mm. You know, it was interesting. Um, I was in a session with uh, Frank Oz near the end of his um, run, but I was bringing up, I brought up earlier that Joe Raposa was always late. Mm -hmm. He would call me and say, oh, we got to, I need you for a whole day. Because I would do a lot of the MIDI and the, the programming stuff. We, we did a, shiny town station or whatever that was so do you know that show uh, i i can't say that i do it, it's like a it was like a train show or something it was one that he did near the end of his uh, life but but he would call me and say oh i gotta do a lot of stuff like that and 
and we'll, we'll, I'll see you tomorrow at 10. Then I would get a call from him like at eight at night and said, boy, there's a lot to do. Can we start at nine? I go, sure. Then I get a call from him like at 10 at night and goes, can we start at eight? And I go, sure. So of course, I, that would meant that I was coming in at 6.30 or seven because I want to make sure everything was set up and all the synthesizers were going. Mm-hmm. And eight o'clock would come, there'd be no Joe, nine o'clock, no Joe, 10 o'clock, no Joe, 11 o'clock, no Joe. Oh, Finally, man. like at 12 or one, Joe would come barreling through the elevator. And is this in 12 the- in the afternoon or 12 at night? This is 12 noon, lunch okay. time. But well, you know, at least he didn't keep you waiting too, too long then. <laughs> well, but it's four hours of me sitting around and it wasn't like I wasn't going to get paid or something, but I'm not, I'd rather be doing something than waiting so anyway joe would come in and of course we're already now behind schedule because he had me come in two hours three hours early because he was concerned about how much he had to do and he shows up two hours late well then he barrels through and plays this and because i was a musician he would do something kind of sloppy and he goes oh you'll fix my fat fingers and he and he would like just dismiss it and so here i am collecting all the files that we need to do and then he would look at his watch and go oh my goodness it's five o'clock i gotta go let me play these last four cues and he would really (laughs) rip through those and play them just a, it was a mess really oh my god and then he would run out the door like at six and go oh i'm late and then as he'd go out he goes oh this has got to be in fedex for tonight <laughs> now fedex cutoff was nine o'clock so now i've got three hours to fix all of this crazy stuff and get oh. it made and i i can't tell you how many sessions i would run to that well then he passes away and I go to his funeral up in Bronxville, which was like the who's who of who's who. The only person that wasn't there that was fa- that would be famous was Frank Sinatra. Everybody else was there. I mean, Walter Cronkite was there. These are the people that I remember just, but, but everywhere I turned, it was like, oh, I know that. Oh, I know that person. And, um, and I don't remember exactly what time his funeral was but let's say it was at 12 noon or whatever Mm -hmm. and we all go into the church and we sit there and it's 12 noon and we're waiting for the service to start and it doesn't start we sit there and wait and it gets to be 12 30 and it gets to be one o'clock an hour late and in they roll in the coffin of joe Raposo. Is that like a little homage and, to him being well, late? Well, and I sit here and say, you know, my friend said, you know, that when we, uh, my friend who went to the funeral with me said, well, he can't get any later than this. And of course he did. He got, he came an hour late to his own funeral. Well, I bring up this story to Frank Oz when we were in a session. I just say, you know, I always think it's interesting that Joe was late to his own funeral. At which time Frank Oz loses it and goes, that son of a gun. I don't believe he did this to me. And I'm going, Frank, I didn't mean to upset you. He goes, no, you didn't upset me, Tom. It just pisses me off that I didn't figure it out until just now that that son of a gun had it in his will that he'd be an hour late. So we would all be waiting one hour. Just like he did to you guys in real, when he was in, alive. Exactly. But, but I, it always, I always got a kick out of it because Frank Oz is annoyed that it took him that long to figure it out. I, I'm annoyed by the fact that it took me so long to get my uh, talking Ernie doll working and had no idea that it actually does that. So I know well, how you feel. I bet your dad, I bet you if you ask your dad, th- that's the reason that the batteries were taken out. Your dad probably one day went, oh, enough with this. <laughs> I actually, my parents didn't even know I was that it was supposed to talk because I posted on Facebook and Instagram uh, that I got the batteries to work. And my mom's like, that thing talked? And I was like, apparently, I didn't realize that. Uh, I feel like it might have been a gift from somebody who uh, gave it to my parents who gave it to me when I was born. 
So moving on a little bit from Sesame Street, you worked on some of Eartha Kitt's albums. Uh, I did. Did you get to know her very well? Oh, yeah. I was her musical director from 1978 till about 85, about seven years there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful talent and wonderful performer. What I always loved about Eartha that I was always impressed with is that she... We could be anywhere. And and I worked with her after John Lennon had been shot in my neighborhood. So it was like, you know. Oh, yikes. It was, it was um, you know, it was nerve wracking for famous people to kind of be out amongst the public because you don't, you, you, you know, that, that really kind of put shiver down everybody's spine. But Earth and I could be anywhere in an airport, at a restaurant. And if you came up as Joe Blow and said, Earth, could I have an autograph? She would take your football or whatever you had and she would sign it and say, and say, I hope you have a nice day. Aww. But if you were the producer of the show that we were working on and you came in with her two bottles of Don Perignon that was in her rider of her contract that she got two bottles of Don Perignon for every show one of which we used in the show one of which she put in her bag and she must have had quite a collection of don perion when she uh, passed on but if he came in and said would you sign this uh, photograph for me she would always say no and and i i asked her i go why do you why do you say no to these people and you say yes to these people? She goes, because the people on the street are the ones that made me famous. Oh. She goes, the producer who comes in and is paying me and giving me the champagne thinks he owns me. Wow. And so she goes, and he doesn't own me and he won't get an autograph from me. Wow. That's quite the so, story. So I thought that that was, I was always very impressed with her because you see so often uh, the paparazzi and people that showbiz people are nice to other showbiz people, but are kind of rude and, and, and dismissive of the Joe Blow. She was just the opposite. Wow. She always had the greatest respect for the unknown individual that would come up and ask it for something. My, uh, the only thing I know of Eartha Kitt for besides her music, like, again, I'm a Disney kid. So I, uh, Oh, well, she did, uh, Eveline, uh, what, what, what was the, uh, Esmeralda or what was it? Yzma on Emperor's New Groove. Yes. And, and you know who does it now? I, I don't actually. Leslie, Leslie Carrera. Oh, wow. Well, I just made myself look like a total loser there. <laughs> no, no. I'm just saying that I don't know whether she's still doing it, but I remember when Leslie was first starting with Abby that that Eartha had passed on and then she started doing uh, her for the for the cartoons or, you know, TV shows or whatever. Yeah. I yeah. Emperor's New Groove uh, came out when I was really, really little and I grew up watching the series Emperor's New School, and one of my past guests, uh, Bob Bergen, he's Porky Pig, Tweety, Marvin the Martian for Looney Tunes, but he also was uh, Bucky the Squirrel on the Emperor's New Groove. Yeah. And he did that for me when he well, came on here. Well, you're not a loser. I didn't bring that up to make it. I was just saying that it's interesting because I remember that uh, that Leslie would be, you know, she was very excited that she was doing it. She would be practicing her Eartha, you know, and, and I would say very, very good. Mm. I don't I think she. I don't think she really knew my my connection with her. Mm. Oh wow! Well, I remember practicing watching the Emperor's New Groove as a kid, and I remember imitating a llama. He's supposed to be dead. So that's my best Eartha Kit impression right there. It's not. Yeah, well, less less jaw. I okay. used to always say with Eartha that if she breaks her jaw and they wire it shut, we're still in business. Because she really talks without moving her lower jaw. I see. 
So you also worked on uh, the series All My Children. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about I wrote about music that? for people to do bad things to each other. <laughs> like, like score? Like score composing yeah. over them doing uh-huh. bad things? Yeah, yeah. Matter of fact, most of the stuff that I did was when they couldn't find stock music to drop in, they would give it to me and I would get to score it. I, I always loved doing that. My biggest project was I did uh, Erica's Last Wedding on All My Children, and mm-hmm. we won an Emmy for it. Nice. That's the Emmy I won for All My Children was for Erica's Wedding. That's, that's amazing. So do you have a different approach between working on albums and CD-ROM video games and for toys and for TV shows and movies? Because basically you're kind of doing the same thing, but it's for different projects. So when it comes to that, do you have a different approach for when you're working on them? Well, when you're working on toys or anything with chips and with low fidelity, you have to take, yes, I, I and especially with Elmo, who's so dynamic and da da da. <laughs> he's always banging on the things like that well i have to figure out how to get that a, a lower fidelity can't deal with that dynamic range you know and so we, you have to figure out how to get it squeezed into uh sound so you know i did a lot of work on that um the the other stuff for the show it's it's pretty much character driven and and my experience over the years is that the person doing it all of jim henson which we spoke of earlier Mm -hmm. he knows when he's earning and he knows when he's not earning and so that you know they're 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 policing that um you know for so many years i was the recording studio and um you know you just do your best to to record it at the same time. I remember Frank Oz was always very good at letting us know as an engineer, you know, that he would be doing something. And then if he was gonna do one of his screams or, you know, Grover landing or whatever, he, if he was gonna do a scream, he would always, he was always very good. He was always looked at, at me as, when I was the engineer and I'm sure he did it with everyone, but he'd go, uh, he goes, uh, I don't remember what he would say exactly, but he would let me know that he's going to be screaming in a second, <laughs> which, which then I would lower the gain on the microphone so that, um, so that we wouldn't have distortion. And he, w- he was always very, he was the best at, at, at understanding what was going on on the other side of the, of the, of the, um, window he would give you a warning and it was nice i always considered it nice that he did that for me but um the reality is is that he didn't want the recording to go bad and he'd have to do it twice i see wow so do you have a favorite project that you've ever done in your entire career Hmm. Uh, let me see here. Well, I worked with a group called Gotham for many years. You can Google that. Okay. It's, uh, it's, they're on, I know that they have a, a one performance of ours on YouTube called There's No Business in Show Business. And mm-hmm. I must say that performing with three of those young men <clears throat> I really enjoyed and probably is the closest to Beatlemania. When you say, oh, what did I want to be at the beginning was the Beatles. The closest I ever got to Beatlemania was with those three young men because we would go down to Washington, D.C. or oh, oh, well, L.A. we would do. We, we, wherever we performed, they were a real gay cult thing they were kind of grace what grace and what's the what's the uh tv show uh, grace and um frankie no no it's a tv show um that 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 had a lot of gay humor 
in it. Might, um, might, be, might be that one. I'm going to Google. Will and Grace. Will and oh, Grace. Oh yeah, I love Will and Grace. Will Gotham was Will and Grace ten years before that. Will and Grace. Okay. And they were very very funny, and I enjoyed playing with them a lot. They're I, the the two stories about them that are off the track from your Sesame World, but we would get up and we would perform and they would do their first song and then they would say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, we're Gotham and we are here to offend every race, creed and color. So oh, if we God. miss anybody, please stand up. And they were oh, kind of like yikes. a cross of the, of the Marx brothers, the Andrews sisters and Don Rickles. And they would go around and, and, diss the audience and this that and my favorite show with them was there was a period where they where we were really a big deal in in new york and we were doing a cabaret i think it was at um 88s was the name of the club mm -hmm. it was a little uh, nightclub irv ray owned it and the boys talked irv into letting them do, uh, well, to this day, in cabaret, they'll say uh, $5 cover, two drink minimum, right? Mm -hmm. And that $5 cover, three of the dollars is going to go to the performer, two is going to the, to the owner. And, of course, the owner wants to make sure that there's enough action, so he would say a two drink minimum. Well, the boys talked. When you talk about one of my favorite moments is that, uh, they talked Irv Rabel into doing a show and, he, and they gave him a cut. And they said, you'll make more, we promise. And they did no cover, two song minimum. Mm -hmm. Well, they went up and they did two songs and then they pulled out a paper bag and went around to the audience <laughs> and made them tip them by putting money in the bag. Oh, and wow. They they would reach in the bag and go five bucks <laughs> and they would embarrass. So the, by the time they got to the back of the audience, people were putting in twenties, fifties, just don't embarrass me. Well, at the end of these shows, we ended up with a bag full of money. Ooh, much more than we would have made with the two drink, a $5 cover, two song, you know, two drink minimum. I always love that. No cover, two song minimum. <laughs> Oh, so they're very funny. So if you want to see them, you you Google Gotham. There's no business in show business. And you'll see them. Awesome. Well, Tom, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, chat and get nostalgic with me. Is there anything else you'd like to say? No, it was a pleasure meeting you. I'm glad you're digging this stuff up. You certainly know more about it than I do. I've so. I've heard I've heard that quite a lot from some of these people who've come on. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. Well, thank you very much. Amazing, and 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 you should be proud of that. The world needs people like you to to historically put it together. You know. Well, thank you very much. And also, uh, once again, a big thank you to Ivy Austin for getting Tom and I in touch. Uh, this really was a very interesting conversation, going a little bit behind the scenes of some of the things that I grew up with. Like I never would have guessed that you had done the bubble sound effect for Elmo's World. That was a really interesting thing to know. <laughs> I will never look at Elmo's World the same now. <laughs> uh, yeah. well, I don't think they do the bubble anymore, do they? They, they don't, but I just love watch. I love watching all the retro stuff. Even before I was born, like my parents will walk by and they'll see that. There I'm were watching. other sound effects that that uh, that, that Robbie Merkin had come in and, and developed and they all they all were in the studio and we had to throw them in at the beginning of of each show. I don't know why we had to throw it in over and over, but we did. <laughs> <laughs> it was employment for me. Yeah, well, gotta 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 be Gotta make hard, a I job guess. somehow. You gotta gotta yes. work somehow. Well, yeah. it's a pleasure meeting you. Uh, James, and thank you so much for uh, reaching out. Ah, you're very welcome. And to the listeners, stay tuned next week for episode number 20. Peace.